So for the sake of time, um, I'm going to hand it off straight to Diego, who has a really, really important talk prepared. I, I hear it's the best rant he's going to give all year. Is Do you think that's a good way of selling it? Uh, I I definitely agree with that type of uh with that analysis. Justin has has not heard this talk, but he has heard me talk about this talk, and it's so he's he's really confident that this is the one that it's going to be. We're going to be talking about in particular how to care for your long hair. Um, so you know, shampoo, conditioner, that kind of stuff is extraordinarily important. But your choice of which one that you are going to use is just as important as using them to begin with. That's actually not what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> we're going to be talking about privacy today. Why is privacy important? Kind of privacy in the uh, area of cryptocurrencies. Um, it's something that's extremely overlooked. And you know what? That's one of the big things that we like to do is try to educate people on why is privacy important and all this different kind of stuff. And I have noticed something. I have noted something. You know, every once in a while, the community funds me to go to this, that, the other conference in Las Vegas and whatever place. I, I go to different conferences, right? And what I have discovered is I sit in my little Monero table and uh, wait for people to come by for me to talk to them about Monero is I am very rarely selling Monero as a coin. Like I'm very, very rarely selling this coin. I find that I'm more often selling an alternative worldview, a different worldview to the, what people are used to. It's a worldview that where privacy is important. It's not taken for granted. You know, privacy and security are um, top priorities for people and for society. And if you grab onto this worldview, if you understand this worldview, then Monero sells itself. It becomes extremely self-evident as to why something like Monero needs to exist in the world. And the, the failings of Bitcoin as well really kind of um, become self-evident. But if you don't latch on to this um, to this worldview, if I try to talk with you about it, you're like, eh, you know, I'm, I don't really buy into this. Well, you know, it's okay to be wrong, first of all. But second of all, uh, they're, they're not going to really get Monero. It's just not going to make sense to them. Why is this necessary? What, what does it have over Bitcoin? Nothing it is their response. If you don't grasp this worldview, you're not going to understand Monero. More often than not, so you know, just to summarize that little piece, more often than not, I find myself selling a worldview more than I am selling a coin. Um, and that worldview is privacy. Um, in fact, I would say like 90% of my words when I'm speaking at these conferences is not I only talk about Monero the very last 10% of my rant. And then because I'm like, so everything I just described, yeah, Monero basically does that. And they're like, oh, okay, that, that totally makes sense. Um, and so it's it's helpful to kind of to kind of look at the past of cryptocurrencies, kind of look at the past of privacy, and, and you know, kind of like uh, Matthias was saying, uh, in in um, in the EU and in other places, privacy is under attack in in, in various capacities. Um, so Justin sent me a cool little outline that I've got on my phone. He's like, here, Diego, don't deviate from this. Otherwise, you're going to go on for three hours and we will lose all of our viewership. He didn't actually say that. Uh, but <laughs> uh, for just as a small, quick reintroduction, my name is Diego Salazar. Rabrar, I do some stuff about uh, in some things in the Monero project. I run Cypher Market, a little business. I uh, work on the website and I made these little guys, which you'll be able to purchase at some point here pretty soon. Uh, one day. Uh, so, uh, first off, I wanted to kind of talk about, um, well, I guess I want to start this conversation off kind of um, looking at the history of Bitcoin, kind of looking back when cryptocurrencies first started and the pseudonymity of Bitcoin and, and exploring the question, was it enough then? Is it enough now? Why, why not? Because really Bitcoin, if we're honest, it sets the standard for everything. Everybody knows Bitcoin. Mostly everybody respects Bitcoin in some capacity. And it, it's the, the gold standard for cryptocurrencies. And uh, a lot of the Monero people think that it, it fails spectacularly in terms of privacy. But let's take a look, right? Was Monero private enough way back then? So back then, you know, Monero, I'm mean, not, sorry, not Monero, Bitcoin. Bitcoin has always been open and public and transparent. It, there has never been a time where it um, it has been similar to Monero and they chose to forego that technology for some reason. It's always been open and transparent. The issue is, so I, I would argue actually that Bitcoin was private enough back then, even though it was just pseudon pseudonymous, not anonymous. And the reason I would argue that is because it was so new that nobody was thinking to track these things. Um, 
So for those of you who don't know, metadata kills. Metadata is that type of thing like the subject line of your email or how long were you on a call? It was 37 minutes or who were you talking to? Well, like it was between this person A and person B. Um, this is all metadata. So it's not the actual content of the call. It's not the actual content of the email. It's just kind of the things about it. But a lot of things can be deduced from metadata. Um, as an example, if the location of a call, my call is on a bridge somewhere and the recipient of my call is a suicide prevention hotline. You know, you don't know the contents of my call, but just from those two metadata points, you can, you can maybe deduce what the content may have been. And uh, so, you know, there's a very famous quote by some governmental agency. I don't remember off the top of my, which one it is, but uh, we have killed based off of metadata is what it said. Um, Metadata is enough to incriminate people. Metadata is enough to uh, to kill some people, to take away some people's freedoms. So, but that that metadata has to be collected. Like if no, if if I make a call and it lasts thirty minutes, but nobody thinks to write down somewhere that this call lasted thirty minutes, then that then that will be kind of lost in time, um, and nobody will will ever know. So. When Bitcoin kind of first started and all these transactions were going around, we do have the record of these transactions existing, which Bitcoin went where, but nobody was really thinking that this was going to be a big thing. I don't think anybody was really uh, caring so much to track all of this metadata about who was online at what times and, and cross-reference that with people who have downloaded Bitcoin and all these different types of things. So I would argue that Bitcoin was good enough um, privacy wise, fungibility wise, with the pseudonymity that it had. But then as it gains in popularity and more eyes look at it and more people look at it and they start saying, hey, this is something big. And I understand that if I start taking this metadata and I, I start collecting this metadata, when is Diego? Diego downloaded the Bitcoin Core software. What, what times is he online? What times is this other person that he is known to deal with online? Okay, there is a transaction that happened in Diego's prime online times and received at this other guy's prime online times. Maybe, you know, maybe I can connect this person to that person or, or these people to those people. And now that people know to collect the metadata around these transactions, you can be sure that it is being collected. So then the question becomes, is Bitcoin now private enough with this metadata being collected? The answer, I believe, is a resounding no. So the question then becomes, is Monero private enough with this metadata that's being surely collected around the Monero transactions? And my answer is we are still doing a whole lot of research to figure that out. I would say mostly yes, you know, but it's very hesitant. There's a huge asterisk there with a lot of other things going on in there because privacy is really, really hard. Let me say that again. Privacy is really, really hard. Let me say that a third time for you people that you just can't get it in your head, in your heads. Privacy is really freaking hard to get right. You can't just bolt it on. You can't just say, we're going to throw Tor on this and it's going to work. You can't, none of this works guys. Privacy is so difficult because the people will find ways to not only compromise your software, but there's certain metadata being collected that you never considered. And then for some reason that just completely exposes you and you're completely screwed. And all it takes is once, all it takes is one breach of your privacy. And from there, just all these things just start connecting the dots and things just start making uh making a lot more sense because we are whether we like it or not we are entangled in a web of society and i don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist but we are entangled in this web of society and, and to kind of get this point across we most people know that facebook collects all these information about everybody let's say i don't have a facebook i've never had a facebook and so you can't find me on there Facebook probably still knows that I exist simply because if my family uses Facebook, if my friends use Facebook and they say, oh, look, I'm over here at this coffee shop with uh, person X, person Y and person Z, all of which are on Facebook so you can tag them and Diego. And Facebook's like, hmm, Diego. OK, we don't have Diego in our database, but we also have somebody else named Salazar who's talking about Diego and this other person in the same town is talking about Diego. So from this web, they can kind of see that Diego exists. And also they can kind of see the things that Diego does, 
the people he hangs out with, the places he spends his money, because not because I'm giving them that data, but because a whole bunch of other people are giving them clues. And from all of those clues, they can put this together. So there's this big, gigantic web. And I liken privacy to driving. Even if I am the best driver there is, the safest driver there is, I take zero chances. It's not me that I have to worry about on the road. It's everybody else. It's that one random drunk driver who could still kill me even if I'm the safest guy. And even, and even then, all it takes is one failure on my part to be a safe driver. I could be a safe driver 99.999% of the time, but on the 0.0001% where I'm not safe, maybe that's all it can take as well in, in the sense that uh, your privacy is only as strong as your OPSEC during your entire lifetime. Because once privacy is given away, it can't be taken back. So all of these little points that I'm trying to, uh, to make, if, if it seems like I'm jumping around a little bit, let me just pull it back into this, um, into this one area where I, privacy is extremely difficult and it's even more so now that there is this there is the technology enabling passive surveillance so people can collect all this metadata and store it basically for free in fact it's cheaper to i mean it's it's more expensive to throw data away than it is to throw it at this point just in terms of the returns that you get on it as well as people giving away their data freely to things like social media sites surveillance capitalism all this kind of stuff going on um so not only is this stuff being um taken in passively but also when you know you are look uh seen looking at things like monero or or you are a face in monero anyone like justin or or francisco or myself who we have our faces and names associated with the project you know you can be sure you're on a list somewhere um privacy is really difficult and so bitcoin with its open transparent nature with its ability to look at all of these outputs going here there and elsewhere and it's just not good enough anymore because of all of these other connecting points of metadata around them. It, it's fairly, it, it's getting more and more trivial every day to point which transactions go where, when, why, how. So maybe, you know, if you started way back when, when Bitcoin first started and you still haven't moved your coins, you know, you're probably safe because nobody was thinking to collect metadata back then. But even this statement is based on the assumption that nobody was thinking to collect that metadata back then. Maybe there was somebody that was. And uh, if, if so, then all of this is, is, is moot. Um, so, you know, Monero, uh, we make no guarantees in terms of 100% privacy. I don't think any serious privacy project does. Tor does not, I2P does not, all of them have a threat model. All of them talk about the weaknesses of their different threat models and stuff like that. If anyone tries to sell you 100% privacy, 100% untraceable, they have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea how privacy works. They, they really just don't. Um, privacy is a bunch of tools in a big tool belt, which includes things like open source software, which includes things like uh, Tor for privacy and IP addresses and Monero for privacy and finances. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because before Monero, there wasn't really a tool for absolute privacy. I, I say absolute, but, you know, I, I, have, I have quotes around that. Uh, privacy in in terms of finances so before like even if you had a dark web website and stuff if they can track down your server then they just follow the money who paid for this now with something like monero uh, it's it's becoming more uh, difficult to do that as well um which is good in some ways and bad in, in other ways um, another issue before i move on that i would like to address because i did just mention the dark web and kind of following the money here and maybe that's used to catch criminals which we usually agree is good but like his uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Monero is very much like the atomic bomb of the financial world. The atomic bomb can do a lot of damage to a lot of people. It, it can. And so the question is, should this thing even exist? You know, should this thing even exist? It does exist. So we can't just like make it not exist or forget it exists. It does exist. Uh, the question is, should this even exist? And so, you know, I've had discussions with several people that I, I, I just, I just feel uncomfortable with something like Monero existing. It would enable a lot of bad things, to which I can't deny. That's definitely true. Um, it can enable a lot of bad things. But the way that I look at this, um, this powerful privacy is, you know, you have a saw, a regular saw, if you can imagine a regular saw. And I can cut down a tree at a certain pace with that saw. So I can do good, honest, regular work with that saw. I can also cut apart a human body at a certain speed with that saw. So I can do damage, destruction to humanity with this, uh, with this tool. Now, the upgrade of a saw is a chainsaw. And with a chainsaw, which I have used before, um, 
my uh, my father-in-law has some nice little cool land in the woods and so i used a chainsaw we were cutting down some little itty bitty trees um i can cut down this tree much faster with a chainsaw but i can also cut a human apart much faster i can do damage to humanity much faster with it for every single tool that exists you can do good things with it and you can do bad things with it and the more powerful the tool the the faster you can do good things the more good things you can do <laughs> and the uh the the faster you can do damage with something like this so the question is should this technology even exist uh you know that that's that's a question for the philosophers to talk about the fact of the matter is it's here it's here right now uh and we can't really put it we can't put the cat back in the bag man it's already here um the best we can do is uh try to move the project in the direction that we think is best for the world and for humanity. So anyway, sorry to go to that little morality side note. Um, it's just, it is something that I actually get asked quite a lot when I, when I talk about these types of things, because it does enable a lot of good things and enables a lot of people to hide from totalitarian regimes. It enables a lot of people to hide their wealth from people that might otherwise steal it. Um, but it, it might enable a lot of things that some might consider bad. So, so uh, let's go ahead and keep going. Let's keep talking. So, you know, Bitcoin has some of these cool things. They're like, yeah, yeah, guys, we understand Bitcoin is not private. A lot of Bitcoin people say Bitcoin's not private, but they say, but see, we got things like Lightning Network that's really going to help. We got things like CoinJoin that's really going to help. And then some forks from Bitcoin happen and they're like, yeah, see, we like this whole coin join thing and we put it in by default. So like, you know, all the stuff, how the mixing happens kind of, or um, it's heavily encouraged or any of this type of stuff. And we put Tor on there and we did a whole bunch of no other things. So the question becomes, is Monero going overboard with privacy? Is Monero like really, maybe the coin join is enough. Maybe it's enough. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that, guys. Is coin join technology enough? Is this kind of mixing coins, uh, trying to wash your coins? Is this enough? Is it enough to get people off of your trail? Um, the jury is largely still out on this, but it's leaning towards no. It's leaning towards this idea that it, your coins can still be followed. And if you do some research on the internet, do some Googles, listen to some stories, you know, some might say, well, it's just fear mongering. They're not true. It needs to be verified and fair enough, you know, but you're, you're going to come across some um, where people have like, well, I did mix my coins or I did do these things. And then uh, all of a sudden uh, my, my transaction got canceled. There was actually one on the Reddit for Monero that was linked to the Bitcoin where a guy was saying, I moved my, I washed my coins, I mixed my coins and my thing still got shut down. How did this happen? Um, it's, it's honestly looking like the answer is no. And once again, people just look at this, this coin join, this mixing in a vacuum, as opposed to along with correlating metadata, they just think, oh, well, in a vacuum, if you look at the blockchain, it should be hard to follow. Yes, this is probably largely true, but the blockchain does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a largely uh, connected world where all of this metadata will help you kind of say this coin was starting at Diego and went elsewhere to this other guy that we know. Um, and in fact, we, we at Monero and the MRL and all these people believe that not only is CoinJoin not enough, the question is not, is CoinJoin enough? The question is, is Monero enough? Do we need to up the ring size? Do we need to, you know, like, man, like, it, are we good enough? Because privacy is hard and we, we really just don't know sometimes. Um, you know, there are some days where it's like, yes, definitely. This, this is the best that we have and Monero is good enough. And there are some days I'm like, oh man, guys, what are we doing? Oh, there is no way. There is no way. But, you know, I, I would rather not back down from a challenge like this because people don't make history books by backing down from difficult things. Now, people make history books because they look at a challenge, they look at something hard, and they say, we're going to do this and we're going to do this right. And it changes the world. That's what I want to be. I want to be a world change maker kind of guy. Anyway, don't go very deep into history since Fluffy Puff Coney already covered this point. Stress that blah, 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 blah. Monero got better. Zero coin and Zcash. Yeah. Zero coin and Zcash. So, um, Monero is not the only privacy coin as uh, they are coined, that the term, the coined term privacy coin, which I think is a misnomer and a lot of people would agree with me. Uh, it's, I think that things like Bitcoin and stuff should be called transparency coins and things like Monero should be called cryptocurrencies because privacy should be the default as opposed to having a segment of cryptocurrencies called privacy coins. But anyways, um, cryptocurrencies, uh, 
there's a few other ones that have different privacy schemes. You know, Monero uses a combination of three um, privacy technologies. We use ring signatures, we use ring CT, and we use stealth addresses. And the idea is that each of those limits metadata in some way and where the weaknesses of one start, the strengths of another begin, wait, where the weaknesses, where the strengths of one stop, forget it. You guys know what I'm saying. They cover for each other. They help each other. Um, so, and and the, the actual cumulative effect of the privacy is more than the sum of their parts um, in this particular case. So, and then pretty soon, you know, Tor and I2P will be integrated as well, which will uh, also be helpful. But there does exist other privacy technologies, other ways of trying to mix coins that are not things like CoinJoin. And this is things like the zero coin protocol as implemented in something like Pivx, I think is the biggest one, which is a hilarious name. But that aside, it's good that there is that they have this implementation. And uh, Zcash is the other big one that most people know, which implements the zero cash, not zero coin, but zero cash, which is based off of the zero coin, but it's its own thing, zero cash technology, which um, I think most people here would agree is stronger than Monero when used Z to Z and used consistently and by default. Um, and it scales better and all this different kind of stuff, but there's this big asterisk because Zcash's actual implementation is uh, not the kind that uh, advocates for default privacy. And that's a big poking point that we use uh, with them. But there are these other things that exist and they all have their pros and cons. And I think this is one of the big things to understand is that all of this is a pro con game. All of this is a, a way, the strengths and the weaknesses of this. For example, in adopting the privacy technologies that we have in Monero, we have sacrificed scalability to a degree. To which degree? We don't know yet because cryptocurrencies are not used far and wide and we don't see how they scale for reals. But we have sacrificed scalability to a degree. Each individual transaction, meaning each, each individual block, is much larger, even with the bulletproof shrinkage, which is awesome, it is still much larger than an average Bitcoin transaction. Just because in addition to um, all of the normal information about who's sending to what, where, with the block headers and all this different kind of stuff and the transaction stuff, we also are layering on these, these obfuscation, encryption, privacy enhancing technologies. And that takes up space because that's being stored on the blockchain indefinitely. Um, so Bitcoin does have the advantage that it scales a degree better. Again, which degree? We don't know and people have different opinions, but it does scale a certain degree better than Monero does. Um, in a sense, you know, if you talk with Arctic Mine, he'll talk with you, okay, I'm a dynamic block size, blah, blah, blah. You know, we can go down that rabbit hole as well. But it, it is something that we sacrifice. You know, Monero uh, transactions are bigger. So all of this is kind of pros and cons. All of this is weighing this stuff. And zero coin and zero cash each have their own pros and cons as well. For example, zero cash, Zcash, as most of us know, has a trusted setup. In order to get this fantastically scaling, fantastically private um, technology to work correctly, it has to be set up initially by somebody and if that initial setup is compromised, then that individual can print free money for infinity time and nobody would be able to catch it. As well as some people, you know, recently people like Peter Todd have been skeptical about the claims that a, a compromised uh, startup ceremony would not compromise privacy. Maybe it might. We, we're, there's not enough research into that area right now. So I, I can't say one way or the other, but there are pros and cons. And Monero may not be the best way. Monero may not be the best way. I'll say that again. Um, people are often surprised to find out that I am not a maximalist. I am not a Monero maximalist. It is not Monero or the highway for me. I, I'm, I constantly publicly say I own only Monero. I don't own really anything else. Um, I own a little bit of TerraCoin because I did a little bit of website for them before I saw the light and then they paid me in TerraCoin and now I have TerraCoin. So yeah, you can look that up if you want. It's not much money. Um, I, I basically only have Monero. And the reason is not because I'm a maximalist and it's like, well, if Monero fails then I just want everything to fail, um, it's because I don't believe Monero has any good competition right now. I want Monero to have competition because competition drives the whole space forward, but there is not anybody that's willing to um, commit hardcore to having a privacy by default and mandatory type thing. Nobody else has really done that. There, there's a couple of little players and we'll see where they where they end up and that's kind of exciting. But by and large, nobody has really committed to that kind of thing because they're worried about, well, what about the governments and what about shutting us down and what about this X, Y, and Z? Um, 
So if something else comes along, great. And if Monero itself is merely a stepping stone to a better cryptocurrency that is um, private by default, fungible, all these different things. If Monero is just a stepping stone so that we can have that, then by all means, let Monero die in its proper time so we can have that thing. All I care about is private digital money uh, that is fungible, that is available to the world to protect humanity. That's what I care about. And if Monero is that, great. If Monero is a stepping stone, great. Let it be that. Um, and who knows? Maybe one day I will jump ship. I'll say, see you all. You've annoyed me too much, and I'm going to go work on something else. Uh, and if that's the case, um, I, I could never do that to you guys. Come on. There's, there's too much heart here. There's too many connections. It's, um, it's more likely a binary fate. We just steal all the money from us playing poker. But, you know, that, that, I digress. <laughs> He will own all of the Monero uh, pretty soon. It's pretty soon here. So um, that that's kind of my, I, I, I kind of jumped to uh, kind of my, my position on maximalism and any that kind of thing. But kind of going back to zero coin and zero cash, there are alternative privacy um, implementations going on. And it's so important that these that they exist. I, I would, some people might disagree with that. But to me, in my opinion, it is so important that these things exist. And the reason is all of cryptocurrency is just one big, gigantic experiment. None of us know whether any of this is actually going to work. And um, science is very cool in that the goal is for science to be reproducible, as in if somebody conducts an experiment, I should be able to do the exact same things with the exact same method methodology, apply the exact same statistics, and get the same results. Um, and so that reproducibility is definitely a core part of science. But if the only experiment that science ever did was, did was the same experiment, then we would not have very many scientific advancements. So it's important that we do have all of these other alternative implementations, most of which I expect will fail. And then we can do an autopsy after they've died and see, okay, why did they die? Maybe it was a, a social thing. Maybe it was a, a failure of of the technology or, or the cryptography or the privacy or anything like that. It's important that these things exist so that we can see largely kind of what, what comes out and, and keeps going. That's not to say that the best technology always wins. So, but it's important that they exist for science. Um, as well, I guess one last little rabbit trail I wanna go down. In regards to Bitcoin, um, Everybody is always talking about mass adoption, kind of for cryptocurrency as a whole, kind of especially for Bitcoin. You know, we want to see Bitcoin adopted. We want to see it get go places. I, if I may make another shocking statement, I would fight tooth and nail against Bitcoin being adopted globally just because of the ability that it gives regimes around the world to track people's finances at an unprecedented level. As Bitcoin becomes more and more adopted, I will fight that it does not. I do not want it to become adopted. For those of us in the first world, I, I say this often, for those of us in the, in the first world, oftentimes the worst thing that we have to deal with with our lack of privacy is things like targeted ads. But many times in regimes that are much worse, uh, these people face very serious consequences for the lack of privacy. And it's so funny to me that things like Bitcoin um, constantly talk about being currency for, for the world, currency for everybody, something that everyone can use. But when you really look, dig down deep, it's not currency that everyone can use because the lack of privacy is appalling and it is very destructive to certain marginalized people groups in different places. Um, it's a classic case of very smart people, oftentimes developers or these types of things, very smart people developing solutions that users don't actually need. This is what Bitcoin is because these people don't just need censorship resistance. They don't just need immutability. They also need privacy. They are not a coin for the world. They are a coin for the first world who don't have severe consequences for lack of privacy. Although the consequences in the first world are getting more severe as time goes on, but they really are not a coin for those people that desperately need it the most. In the same way, I can look at Monero and, and give a similar criticism. While Monero does um, have that ability that Bitcoin does not, because of Monero's bigger transactions and because of Monero's bigger fees, maybe it's not going to be worth it in Venezuela where they get paid uh, a couple of dollars a month to pay 
uh, for slightly higher fees to send Monero, although this isn't as big of a problem now that we have bulletproofs, but um, maybe even those couple of cents or those 10 cents, they won't be able to afford that. So that's not going to be an option for them. So we have to find ways to optimize those types of things as well. So Bitcoin and all the other things like Bitcoin, even though they keep saying we are a currency for the world, we want mass adoption, all this kind of thing, that they really, they really are not looking at the needs of people and meeting those needs, um, which is a classic UI UX failure. We're not actually looking at the goals of the users. We're building what we think they want. This is also called colonialism, by the way, where we decide for other people what they need and what they want. Um, <clears throat> so the fact of the matter is though, um, even though there are a few other privacy implementations, most, most coins are either building completely transparent solutions, maybe because it's easy, because you just fork Bitcoin and you make a few changes, um, or maybe because they're scared of retaliation from the state or whatever uh, their reasoning might be, or they, they do um, subpar implementations of privacy. And I'm not talking about if they choose zero coin or zero cash or anything like that, although I have opinions on those as well. Um, I'm talking about this idea that if they do privacy, you know, not by default, it's kind of opt-in, it's gonna be more expensive. And really all of this just points back to PGP. It likens to PGP for me. For those of you who don't know, PGP stands for pretty good privacy. It is a way in which people can encrypt messages kind of over me email or text or sign things. Um, and it, it, was, it was invented quite some time ago. It was supposed to kind of be the holy grail of privacy. The goal was to have all of the emails and all of the everything integrate PGP um, at some point. You know, and now we have things like ProtonMail and Tutanota that do it by default. But the sad reality is PGP is a hot sack of garbage. It does its job, but the UI, the, U, the user experience of PGP is just horrendously bad. It is, it is laughably bad. It is so hard to set up. It is so hard to comprehend. It is so hard to, uh, to keep track of your keys and make sure that they're safe. And, to, and the idea of cycling your keys every once in a while to make sure that you know, you, they don't get compromised. And PGP is so, so bad. It is a dumpster fire. It is hot garbage because of the user experience because of the user experience. And um, it, it has the potential to do some great things, but it's just not ever going to do those things. Whereas you have something like Signal or Wire, which are uh, messaging apps, and they do encryption kind of by default. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. There are a couple of extra steps, you know, in terms of verification, if you want to do those steps to make sure you're talking to the person who you are talking to, but those aren't required. And you, and they're actually not super hard to do. So in that particular sense, what I did with my parents, I put signal on their phone. I put it as their default messaging app and they don't think twice about anything of it. They just kind of send messages with signal. It works the same as regular stuff, except now it's encrypted. And so now I speak with them encrypted. Well, ha ha. You don't know that I'm asking my mom to get me some milk from the grocery store. Um, because we only have one car and my wife takes it to work. Anyway, uh, now that you guys know about my life. So um, the, the point is that something like Signal takes these, these hard concepts of things like encryption and it brings them down to a level where anyone can use. And so then you see these privacy implementations on alternative blockchains. You see things like Dash, you see things like, um, uh, uh, Zcash or where, where you have to go through extra steps where you have to understand more, maybe have more powerful hardware just to be able to use this, just to be able to understand this, to get your, wrap your head around what you're doing and why you're doing it. And oftentimes the resources needed are also larger. You need to pay a larger fee. Maybe you need, you, like I said, you may need a stronger computer or a stronger phone, or maybe phones can't do it at all because it's so uh, much bigger. Um, and so ultimately you're just, you're just putting this, this wall, this barrier of entry for people to use it. And nowadays, what is PGP used for? Um, very few people actually use PGP. Some people do. A lot of people will put their fingerprint on their Twitter. So like, if you go to my Twitter, um, you'll see that I put my PGP fingerprint there. And oftentimes it's used as kind of this badge of honor. I not only know what PGP is, I have set it up, I have this key. So it says like, I'm, I'm a serious privacy guy. Um, I have gotten a few emails in PGP, which is always kind of fun. I'm like, ooh, look at this. I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and decrypt this and it's kind of fun. But um, 
for the most part, it's not really used for the for the goals that it was intended to uh, to be used for. And so that's largely what I see in terms of Zcash and, and these others. And I, I do hear that Zcash wants to go Z to Z, um, so encrypted by default and mandatory. And when they do, great, more power to them, a thousand times yay. Uh, in the meantime, they have a product that nobody is using. The only people that are going to use it are the tech nerds that are like, ooh, yes, I know how to send a Z to Z transaction, and that's what I'm going to do, more ha ha ha. Whereas something like Monero, you use Monero and you send it and you don't have to really think about the obfuscation and encryption. You don't have to think about any of this. If so, it just happens. And yes, there are suboptimal ways to use it that can kind of out you more than most. But by and large, especially because everybody is hiding in the crowd of everybody, if everybody uses Monero, by and large, it just works. You don't have to think about it. And anything that makes people think anything when using a product is really bad i don't know if any of you guys know anything about ui ux okay but like you don't want people to think about anything when they're using your thing intuitive as defined in in ux circles is this idea that there is a trial and error process of one as in somebody is introduced to a new software and they have a goal they want to accomplish something. It's a new interface. They've never seen it before. But rather than having to try one thing and it fails, and then they stumble upon the right thing, they try once and they meet their goal. Just because the entire interface, it is so blatantly obvious how to achieve their goal that this is what they do. This is the definition of intuitive. Just this trial and error of one. That is all that is needed because the whole interface speaks for itself. If things are not intuitive, in terms of using privacy, people will just not use it. And that is the sad, sad reality. If we don't make it so stupid simple to use, then people will not use it. And we want people to use this. We want people to use this. Even the people that don't necessarily need it, at the very least, they're not, they're doing, it's not like they're hurting themselves as using it, but at the very best, they're providing a bigger crowd for those that do need it to, um, to be able to take advantage of that. So um, <clears throat> we need to make it extremely stupid simple. That's one of the things that I'm working on behind the scenes a whole lot. I, you, you would be shocked about how many wallets of how many cryptocurrencies and how many banking applications, just all mobile, desktop, everything I've been looking at to try to understand a lot of these things um, and how they're used and why. And I've gotten into arguments with Justin and the GUI team and all these different things about... Um, uh, this is something I'm passionate about, you know, uh, about making these things simpler and why, because Monero has a lot of great technology like sub addresses. And, uh, and that's some, that's actually what I was arguing with Justin about the other day, where we're arguing about how to best use sub addresses because they have the potential to be confusing. And the more you have to explain, uh, uh, developers have this idea that as long as your documentation is good enough, as long as you have the words to explain, great. That's good enough. People will read the stuff. Nobody reads the stuff. Nobody reads the stuff. Nobody reads the stuff. Should they? Sure. Will they? No. Um, anyway, so that's kind of just as my whole, whole little rant on this UI UX of privacy type thing. And I, and I am actually really happy to say that even though Monero may not take it as seriously as I'd like, um, by and large, Monero community, because Monero does not exist. You guys know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> Monero exists, but uh, it, it is definitely the one that ha, um, by making it mandatory and default and removing custom uh, ring signature sizes and stuff like uh, ring sizes and stuff like that, we are making this really stupid simple for everyone to use. There's a few hurdles we have to get over in terms of user experience, and those will come. Those will definitely come. Things will get better. But by and large, Monero is much simpler to use in terms of privacy. And most people wouldn't even know that they're being protected. They're just being protected by default. That's cool. That's something I can get behind. I'm all over that. I am all over that. All right, Justin's like, blah, blah, blah. Diego, 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 you're the best. How can you be the best this much? Um, yeah, so we are running out of time. I, I did start a little bit late. So I don't think I can go for that much longer because we are still looking at a puzzle that Need Money 90 is going to give us. And I don't know about you guys, but I would like to win. I'm probably too lazy to win, but I would like to win. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get over there at some point. Um, the reality is that Monero, not Monero, cryptocurrencies really need a 
privacy layer on, on the base layer, on layer one, not layer two. It's not going to be good enough because even if you use layer two back and forth all the time, in the end, you are um, you're settling on a non-fungible transparent chain and there will be metadata that will be used to associate different things. In fact, something cool like layer two lightning network actually is better suited for Monero for a lot of reasons, because not only is layer one completely fung fungible and private, but layer two, which enhances that is once again, going to become more than the sum of its parts in terms of making uh, Monero even better in, in that way. So a lot of these things that are being, um, touted for Bitcoin in terms of the future of privacy actually would just work better on Monero in terms of uh, how much it enhances the privacy. We, we are really doing, we are really at the forefront of um, privacy technologies and finances. It's, it's actually kind of scary because there's nobody to go before us. When we look back or when other projects, I guess like the, the way to say it is when other projects look forward, they can always say, well, Monero was there taking the brunt. Monero is there. We know they, Monero is known as the king of privacy coins. And so everyone's trying to catch up to Monero. But there's a certain comfort that you, you don't have to pave the way 100%. But because Monero is at the head of the pack, it can be scary because there's nobody that went before us. We are charting Un, uh, we, there are uncharted territories, basically, right in front of us. And we are the ones. We are the cartographers trying to figure this out. And that's very, very scary sometimes. It's, it's, a, it's a high calling, if you will, um, not to try to get too much on a high horse about how the Monero community is the next coming of something. But uh, it, it's, it's scary. It's hard. And um, we will fail. We will fail. And as a community, I've been very proud of kind of the open mind that we have and, you know, skepticism Sundays or hearing people out and, um, and, and understanding their... Um, their misgivings or their concerns with Monero, whether it's on a social level or whether it's on a technological level. But um, it's actually really cool to be a part of this project. And if you're kind of watching casually, whether after the fact or you're here live right now, um, and you're, you're thinking, yeah, you know what, this does sound kind of cool. I kind of want to get involved. L let me tell you, man, like Monero is one of the projects to be at. We do a lot of fun stuff. We got a great community. We're, um, we're really at the forefront of a lot of technologies. We're really pushing the bar. Um, and uh, it, it shows Monero is very respected across this cryptocurrency community. Uh, so, except by a few, there are a few who don't, uh, but we love them anyway. We love them enough to just kick them in the shins. So I'm pretty much done. I don't think I have anything else unless there's any questions that uh, somebody has for me. Let me look at the chat. Uh, Revoir doesn't, the Revoir doesn't use sub addresses. How come? So for those of you who don't know, I, I make the Monero Revoir or the Revoir Monero Weekly. Um, if you go to revoir-monero.com, you can see it. It's just a weekly newsletter about all the biggest news, uh, the bigger news things kind of, for, there's price movements in there for those of you who care about those kinds of things and uh, CCS stuff. Uh, what do you mean we don't use sub addresses? Uh, you mean the donation address at the bottom? That's the general fund donation address, man. Like I don't get money from that. If you send to that donation address, it goes to the general fund. It doesn't go to me. Uh, I can ask them to generate a sub address for that if you want me to, and it'll go to them. I mean, you just, you just yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Wasn't Maneruyo developed by a member of the core team? No, actually. Uh, Maneruyo was developed because a guy... M2049er, he's like, oh, there's no Android wallet. I'm going to make it myself. And he did. And um, I I help out the Mineruyo core team, the, the, not the Mineruyo core team, the Mineruyo team a lot. I found after he had made kind of the basics of the, the project, I said, hey, um, I know a couple of designers around here. Do you want me to hook you up with them? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so then the Mineruyo team was born. And so it, it is very much separate from both the core team and the Monero project. It's its own little thing. So if you want to uh, donate to them and love on them and work with them, by all means, please do. They are awesome people. And they have made a lot of cool things that have been, um, once again, setting the, uh, setting the bar from even Monero, uh, like in terms of connecting to remote nodes and stuff. So the answer is no. And okay. Wow, is there still that many people here just chilling, just listening? Yeah, you, you have a following, Diego. 
Oh, yeah. All right, then. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Justin. Be on the lookout for these little plushy gunters coming to Cypher Market, coming sometime near you. It's already there. It is already there. Anyway, um, yeah, thank you, Diego, for walking us through that. I think, like, from a personal perspective, I think it's very odd that you had people that were the forefront of you know, personal autonomy that are, are that are currently and in, in, in the past arguing for Bitcoin. They're arguing that, you know, Bitcoin is what gives people their power back, whatever it might be. And I mean, that's all fine and good, but I just don't understand how they can look at a completely transparent system and say, you know what, I think privacy is something that's like well down in that list. I'm going to say, you know, maybe you can either maybe you can mine your own blocks to, to have privacy. Just, just mine your own blocks and then you'll figure it out. And I, I just think it's ridiculous that, um, I mean, that, that the same proponents that, are, that speak so strongly of you know, the fundamental values of Bitcoin will just so immediately discard privacy. I think that it, if they, I, I think that across the board in the cryptocurrency community, people need to take privacy far more seriously. And I think, even if they're not out there supporting Monero Zcash or whatever it might be, they need to be at the forefront of demanding that, you know, Bitcoin, Litecoin, et cetera, add sensible privacy features to their, to their base protocol, or else we're just going to be a, essentially be building these surveillance systems. And I, I just, I just don't understand how they can just so strongly support a system that ultimately will undermine the individuals that use it. I mean, I, I just think that's kind of crazy. Um, are there any final comments? Um, otherwise, I, I really appreciate you you taking on the task of, of speaking about this difficult, complicated topic. Diego, 